Hello and welcome to chapter 10. In this chapter we will be covering the second part of language which is going to be talking about how we read and comprehend text. So let's begin. So let's start off just by talking about some of the mechanical aspects of reading. A lot of times when you're a really good reader you might not really ever think about these mechanical aspects. If you really struggled to learn to read, you may be very familiar with what I'm going to be talking about in this next section. Um, reading is really an exercise in pattern recognition. Uh, the more words you can recognize on site, the faster you'll be able to read. Like it's, that's basically the, pre the process. So there is a bottom-up component to reading, which is where your eyes are collecting the lines and the angles of the letters and the words and, and casting that back into your occipital lobe for visual processing. Um, and then there is the top-down component of reading, where you impose your expectations, you impose all of your knowledge base, all of your experience as a reader onto the content. Um, one of the most surprising things you can encounter when you're reading is when you're anticipating what word's going to come next and it, an unexpected word comes. You have to actually stop, read it a couple of times, figure out how that fits in this context because you were imposing meaning and you basically knew where the writer was going, right? And then they surprised you. They used a different word or um, they actually ended up talking about something different than you were expecting. Reading is really smooth and, and fluid when... Um, your expectations, your background knowledge match the lines and angles of the letters and the words that are being brought up, right? So that you don't have that kind of conflict. Um, so it's really, if you think about it way back in the beginning of this class, when we first ta started talking about pattern recognition, that's really what's going on with, with reading. Now the eye movements that go on when we're reading, we call those saccades. Um, I've heard some people call them saccades, but I think it should be saccades because it has an E after the D, but anyway, saccades. These are discrete eye movements that you make. You can make saccades for lots of different reasons. It's not just for reading. It's just the um, clinical term for when you're moving your eyes in a pattern. Um, saccadic su suppression is when during saccades, we take in little or no visual information. So as your eye is actually moving, what's being collected by the eye is too blurry to actually provide any information. So your eyes have to settle periodically in what we call fixations in order to actually collect non-blurry sets of lines and angles and things to send back to our um, brain. So you have these saccades and then fixations, saccades and then fixations that you can have these brief pauses to allow for information to be taken in. Usually our fixations are gonna last about um, 200 to 300 milliseconds. So there's a thousand milliseconds in a second. So you're talking about very brief pauses usually on average. Um, sometimes you may have to pause longer. Like I said before, if you have you know an unexpected word that you encounter, you might have to really pause on it. Um, if it's a really long word, you might have to pause um, you know, sort of in the center of it and let your eyes collect the whole thing. Um, you know, there are different reasons why you might settle for longer periods of time, but for most of the time when you're reading, you, um, you, your eyes fixate so briefly that it feels like they're just moving smoothly, um, but they really aren't. They're starting and stopping. All right, so here's an example of a piece of text that was provided to readers, and um, in the little bubbles above each word, you see the duration of a typical fixation that the reader displayed. Um, so you see, for example, that readers paused a lot longer on the word flywheels than they did on, for example, the word the. And actually, you don't even see a bubble bubble over the word of because those filler words like of and the and and, um, uh, those kinds of things, a lot of times you don't need to stop on them because your expectations and your knowledge base tell you what those filler words probably are. Um, so you don't really have to actually see them. They also, it's possible, could be just being captured by the fixation on the previous word or the word following it. It's, you know, it's a small enough word that it might be being included with another word. So you can see that there's a lot of um, variation in how long a person might actually need to pause or fixate. Um, boy, even though they'd already seen the word flywheel as flywheels as the first word in the sentence, 
the readers still hesitated over the word flywheel again on the third line. Um, got a pretty long fixation on that one. So obviously the readers were not really expecting the word flywheels or flywheel in that, um, in that prose passage there. Now the top down aspects, you know, word frequency, if it's a really common word, we're going to see um, smaller. That's why I have the downward arrow there. Um, we'll have smaller um, fixations, shorter fixations. Um, if the word is really predictable, given the other things that you've been reading so far, you'll have a smaller fixation. And the younger you were when you acquired the word as a word that you knew how to read, the less time you'll need to fixate on that word. So, you know, that really impl implies, um, you know, practice and familiarity being really super important for being able to recognize words really easily. On the bottom up side, um, you know, fixations typically land about a quarter of the way into the word. So they tried to put the bubbles in this in this um, diagram, basically in the spot where you would expect the person's eyes to be fixated within that word. But it's about a quarter of the way into the word. So with a short word, it's probably gonna, your fixation will probably cover the whole word. If it's a longer word, like let's say flywheel, um, being a quarter of the way in, you may not see the whole word in one fixation, right? So a long, and depending on the font size and other things, um, a longer word, you might have to actually move your eyes within that word to collect all of the letters. If you're not able to um, really predict what the rest of it must be based on your experience and stuff, you may have to actually move your eyes within the word. Um, so saccade length, um, the length of the word, lo longer words will um, require, I'm sorry, um, no, I was, <laughs> I confused myself in the middle of the sentence. I'm sorry about that. Um, saccade length, yes, the length of the word. The longer the word is, the longer the saccade will be, right? So you're going to be moving your eyes farther when there's a longer word. Um, so the length of the word next to it on the right-hand side can also have an impact on how much you have to move your eyes. So for example, if you have the word flywheels, you might have to actually move your eyes a second time to read the word flywheels. Whereas if you have the words of and the right next to each other, you may not have to move your your eyes in order to um, actually collect that information. If it's a short word to the right of where you're fixated, you're probably going to collect the whole thing. You see that again in the at the end of the first line, you see the last two words are known to, and there's no need to move your eyes to collect to because your um, visual field is big enough to collect known and two simultaneously. So you don't have to move your eyes. All right, that brings us to word skipping, right? Um, the bottom up factor that determines whether you were, skip a word is um, how long the word is. Um, you're much more likely to skip words if, um, it's, if they're short in length, you, if you can collect them with adjoining words. Um, you are, um, on the top down side, going to be more likely to skip a word when the context is highly constrained, which means there's really not much option for what word would come next. You know, like in a, in a logical sentence within the language, the only thing that could possibly follow is this word. Um, you can skip that word. You know that the has to be next, or you know that of has to be next. Um, or that it might be something that's highly constrained enough that it really doesn't matter which one it is, like um, from or to. Like it really doesn't matter, so just keep moving because you'll be able to figure it out from context. Um, also, high frequency words are often skipped. And again, those are oftentimes going to be things like prepositions and articles like, um, you know, before, after, um, the, um, these kinds of words. A lot of times they're such high frequency words that you can recognize them even as you get the blurry version of them. Um, so you can just go ahead and keep moving your eyes. Now, regressive saccades are most likely to occur when the word is difficult. So if we go back to that picture that I showed you earlier, you see a re reg uh, regressive saccade happening on the second line over there towards the right. You see those errors, those arrows going sort of in a circle. Um, that happens when the person has occur uh, um, encountered something that is surprising them or is difficult and they're having to regress back through it. So with re um, good readers, what we typically will find is um, uh, basically going you know, back in a smooth way to where they last understood what they were reading and then they move forward again. With poorer readers, you'll see 
uh, much more, um, you know, they'll go much farther back. They'll have to reread some of the things that they had previously correctly identified in their own head um, and reread those so that they can come up and try and make a better guess at what word they've encountered now. So you'll see these larger regressive saccades with poorer readers, smaller regressive saccades with good readers. It's not a lot of people have this sort of bias where they believe that good readers are always moving forward and they are all their saccades move forward. Um, but all readers come to places in a, um, in, in reading where either maybe they got distracted. I mean, sometimes when I'm reading, I start to think something else and I have to go back to figure out where I was when I lost my, I stopped listening to my reading and, and started thinking another thought. Um, you know, sometimes you, you get distracted in the middle of what you're doing. Um, sometimes you encounter a word that wasn't what you were predicting in your top down, you know, process. And so you have to go, wait, 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 go back to where you last understood it and, and read. A lot of times that's a sign of a really good reader that you were making good predictions and everything had been going fine until you made a bad prediction. And now it is not following, you know, the pattern that you were expecting. Um, so going backwards is not necessarily a sign of poor reading. Um, it's more, you know, how much you go backwards, right? Like how, what's the distance? Like how many words do you have to go back through to get yourself back into understanding what's going on in this sentence? Um, so I just, I always like to really emphasize that because I've seen, um, readers who think they're, they think they are slow readers. And part of the reason why they think they are slow readers is because they find themselves going backwards and they think nobody else does that. And I just want to really emphasize that everybody goes backwards sometimes. Everybody does regressive saccades sometimes. The goal is to not have to go back a really long point in that sentence to catch yourself back up to what you were understanding. All right, now the perceptual span is the amount of text around a fixation point that is effectively covered by the eyes. So I put this little sun symbol around the, the letter A, which is about um, a quarter of the way in if you think about the fact that um, these are relatively small words. So it's not a quarter of the way into that word, but it's a quarter of the way in to the perceptual span. Um, because basically, um, with one glance, you can probably collect about that amount that I put around the, you know, put a box around. You know, people vary. Some people have um, bigger peripheral vision People, other people have smaller peripheral vision, things like that. But when you pause on the A, there's a really good chance that, well, you probably already know that the is there. And then you probably know that the next word is of, and then you really only need text around. I mean, right, there's a lot of guessing that goes along with reading. Um, so that when you just fixate on the A, you can go ahead and move your eyes and let the blurry version of of and A hit your eyes as you're going by to confirm, yeah, I read that right. And then fixate again on the word fixation, right? And then let fixation point effectively all fall into one perceptual span. Um, and that really helps with reading. So um, perceptual span can differ based on orthography. Um, for English writing, which is what orthography means, um, it's usually your perceptual span will encompass about three letters to the left and about 15 to the right. If you read the other direction, like in Hebrew, it's the same number of spaces, but it's going the other direction, right? Because you're reading um, right to left. So it's uh, part of it is the orthography, like how you read. Part of it is the difficulty of the material. The example that I gave you here has pretty simple words in that first part that I've got the box around. Like those are really common words. And so simple words, um, you're going to have a broader kind of perceptual span because you're going to be able to make a lot of guesses about that. Um, so, all right. I think that hits all the things I wanted to talk about, about very mechanical issues. In the next segment, we'll come back and talk about theories of word recognition and how we go about that.